Um, hi, good afternoon. I'm Tamar Meyer, the director of the Reuters Center for International Affairs. I'm delighted to welcome all of you here to the 10th anniversary celebration of the center. Some of you in the room may remember that the, that the institutional commitment to international studies was not yet called global studies, now it is, came in 1994 when President John McArdle conceptualized international studies as one of the areas on which the college would focus and build its national and international reputation. International studies was one of the peaks of excellence and both the excellence and the reputation were to be achieved through curricular and co-curricular activities. This vision was further crystallized by then Provost Libowitz, who in January 2000 revived the PEAK committee to include faculty from humanities, from the humanities, and from the social sciences. The charge of the committee, which became the mission of the center, was to ensure that Middlebury College would indeed become, quote, a place that insists upon and teaches a global understanding that radiates from a core linguistic, linguistic and cultural experience, a cultural competence, end of quote. Co-curricular activities have been the hallmark of what would become in 2002 the Reutin Center for International Affairs after Felix and Elizabeth Reutin established an endowment to support programming in international studies. Their generosity has enabled the rich programming of the center to continue even in bad economic times. With their support, the Reutin Center has become an important resource to the college community and to our neighbors near and far, as well as a research center for both faculty and students. It has been the home for the International Studies Colloquium Series and for symposia and lectures which have been central in infusing our curriculum with a global perspective. It has been the home for scholar in residence and executive in residence and in a word has been at the heart of international and global education at Middlebury. We can say with certainty that our community has been enriched by the nearly thousand speakers who have given talks at this very podium and as much as they have enriched us, we hope that we have enriched them in return. In addition to programming, the center administers grants to support students internationally. More than 40 Middlebury students have received writing center grants totaling over $140,000. And more than 65 Middlebury, Middlebury students and undergraduates from other institutions who study at the Middlebury CV Star schools abroad have received Royalty Center administered Mellon grants totaling $120,000. All this research on international topics is done in, tar in the targeted language and its scope and focus are clearly impressive. These projects are testaments to the degree to which our students have benefited from the center's commitment to, again, advance our students' global understanding that radiates from a core linguistic and cultural competency. Furthermore, over the decade of its existence, the center has employed more than 100 student interns during the school year and in the summer. They assist faculty in the research while being exposed to new areas and continuing their internationally focused education outside the classroom. Often, their work too is in their targeted language, whether the projects are in the humanities or in the social sciences. Over the last decade, the Reutin Center has established itself as the place to go at Middlebury for an in-depth international or global perspectives on social, political, cultural, and economic issues. And this brings me to this panel today. 
It is clear that the world today is far more complex, far, a far more complex place than it was even two and a half decades ago. With the demise of the East-West divide and the rise of new players, you can see them on that map, Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa is missing. <coughs> the world has become more, co more complicated, became more complicated politically, economically, socially, and culturally. The economic dominance of these new players has threatened the position of the United States as a global superpower. And grassroots uprisings from the Occupy Wall Street movement to the Arab Spring, or some of us call it now the Arab Winter, pose a challenge to the hegemonic power associated with the United States and the West and force changes in the global geopolitical landscape. How serious is this challenge? Is it real? What are the international perspectives on the shift? Does it have a role? Does the US have a role as a global power? If so, what sort of role will it be? I've asked my colleagues to address this question using their regional expertise. I've also asked Professor Matt Dickinson to provide an American perspective on this very question, especially as we near the presidential elections. While the panel of faculty members addresses the international perspectives on the political and economic roles of the United States as a global power, the second panel of students will address the same general questions in terms of culture, education, and the environment. We hope you can join us for that panel after dinner at the Atwater Dining Hall. That panel is made up of students who have, who have been grant recipients, who studied abroad, or who are international students speaking from their own experience. Before I call on the participants, I want to call on President Libowitz to say a few words. Thank you, Timmy, and um, welcome to all. Thank you for coming uh, to this um, wonderful panel in celebration of the Rowitzen Center. I might just add a few words before I bring words of welcome and thanks, really, from Felix and Elizabeth, who could not be here today. They were looking forward to coming to Middlebury, but um, their schedule and also some health issues intervened to make it difficult for them. And before I read Felix's comments, I just want to say that it's hard to um, underestimate how or overestimate the impact that this center has had uh, on the college, as Timmy mentioned, uh, since its existence. I could just cite one example. Um, Felix has, I think, written three books in the last five or six years. And on two of those books, uh, he employed some of those student research assistants who are here at the center. And um, he could not have been prouder and happier as a Middlebury alum. By the way, Felix is class of 1949, Middlebury. He couldn't have been prouder of the quality of research assistance he received from undergraduates. And he was quite stunned at the level of linguistic competency and also in terms of sophistication on the research. So that's a great example. I want to just give two little uh, comments also before I read Felix's uh, brief words. Uh, and that has to do with two vignettes about Felix. Um, often described uh, as curmudgeonly sometimes. You know, he has an edge to him, and I think that's um, more or less uh, not fully representative of, of who he is. But in these two examples, um, one of them was going to lunch with Felix um, meant going to the Four Seasons. It was his, his favorite restaurant in New York, uh, and it was a place that one counted on. It was also, I looked forward to going to New York for that reason. Uh, but in any case, one particular day or two particular days, the same thing happened. On this one particular day, we headed out from his office, we crossed in the street. Um, we got a car that took us. He had a black car waiting there to take us over uh, to the Four Seasons. And we were off for about 25 yards, and we got hit by another car. Mm -hmm. And Felix, of course, was flustered beyond belief. He just sort of rolled down the window and got all agitated at the other driver and so forth and so on and decided that we should abandon the car and just walk from Sixth Avenue over to the Four Seasons off, off Park Avenue. So we got out of the car. And what was stunning to me was, if you think about what Felix is known most for, uh, probably most for, is the so-called saving of New York City in the 1970s, in the late 70s. And I was a student and undergraduate in college at the time, was in economics classes that was studying uh, the economics of New York City, 
the famous uh, President Ford quote uh, to New York City, drop dead and so forth. Um, and so we remember that time very well. But on our walk from 6th Avenue to Park Avenue, we were stopped five times by people who just wanted to come up and thank Felix for saving New York. Now, the ironic thing about this was every one of those people who stopped us were younger than I was. So these were people who were pre-college, but yet remembered Felix and recognized Felix and literally shook his hand and we'll let him go thanking him for what he did, which was a really stunning moment and really just gave me a sense of the depth of appreciation for what he had done. And the other was more recent, and it's uh, sort of a very uh, funny one. It's not what I expected, but when Timmy uh, learned that we were going to have this panel, we were talking about this panel and that Felix might come, she did what I think all good directors and, and all you know, people with good instincts do, is she went and got Felix's books. And I remember one evening when we were going back and forth on email about how we were going to plan this, how she was going to plan this panel, um, she commented, which for those of you who know Timmy is quite remarkable, uh, in saying, what a remarkable person. <laughs> and I thought that, I thought that, no, I mean, all, all kidding aside, I thought it was a remarkable thing to read that. I didn't expect her to have that reaction. It was, a, it was, it was Felix's biography, and for those of you who have not read it, uh, it is quite a book. In any case, he's a, he's a terrific person. I'm sorry he's not here. Felix, wherever you are, I hope you're feeling well. So let me read these comments that <coughs> Felix uh, sent along, and you could probably read some edginess uh, into these wonderful comments. So this is from Felix. It says, when I served as American ambassador to France, I was charged, among other things, with promoting American capitalism and the liberty and freedom that are fundamental to it, its dynamism and opportunities it offers. I always have believed that capitalism is the best economic system ever created, yet I was not surprised that seen from abroad, its current practice was not seen as ideal. Our allies overseas were troubled by the social objectives embedded in American capitalism, the lack of a social safety net, the speculative aspect of our markets, and the growing inequality created by our large differentials of wealth. While the international community admires much of what we do, there also is much that is contrary to their beliefs, and in some cases, frightening to them. The death penalty, the power of religion in our politics, and our opposition to certain international laws are just a few examples of deep differences in values. There also is an historical level of anti-Americanism that reflects these differences. Hopefully, they are offset by global recognition of a broad community of interests. Issues such as global economic instability, fear of terrorism, and proliferation of nuclear weapons ultimately must outweigh everything else. Former President Clinton speaks frequently about our increasingly interdependent world. It's good and it's bad, he says. It means we can't escape each other even if we try. And while global interdependency and our awareness of it grow, it isn't exactly a new concept. The late George Kennan, perhaps our greatest diplomat, said the following about how to fight communism in 1946. And I quote, it is not enough to urge people to develop political processes similar to our own. Many foreign peoples are less interested in abstract freedom than in security. These considerations, together with my experience as an American banker and a diplomat, convince me that we have to be able to answer for ourselves five simple questions. What is the fundamental nature of the modern world? How would we like to change it? What steps are necessary to make those changes? Who's supposed to do it? and particularly, what can I do? To me, the Roatan Center is an ideal vehicle for answering these questions and for presenting them to Middlebury students and much more broadly to people around the world. I am honored to support this program and proud of its vital work as an intellectual hub of global understanding and exchange. Thank you. Um, the order of the presentations will be as it is stated on the walls. Um, here is the format. Each presenter will have no more than 10 minutes, and I mean it. I will stop them if they go over. Here, they will all see this. Um, 
and we will hold your questions and we will have uh, Q&A at the end of all the presentations. The first presenter is Professor Nadia Horning of the Political Science Department, whose focus is comparative politics in African politics. Please welcome Nadia. Thank you, Professor Meyer, for organizing this event, and thank you for all of you for coming in such great numbers. Um, do I get extra time yeah, for it. having a continent? Yeah, with you don't have to. <laughs> all, right, all right, so in that case, I'll limit my remarks to Sub Saharan Africa with its 49 nation states. <laughs> Uh, the African states that exist today, as you may know, are products of European colonization, with the great European colonial powers being England, France, Belgium, and Portugal. The U.S. did not enter the African stage, so to say, until they became independent, uh, sorry, until the states became independent in the 1960s. Since then, I would say that there have been two major periods of U.S. involvement in Sub-Saharan Africa. The first one goes from the 1960s to the late 1980s, and the second one from the early 90s to the present. There are two sub-periods in the second one, but why don't we keep Africa simple for the sake of brevity today? <coughs> in the first period, the United States' goal was clear and focused, and its strategy was one of low visibility. Whereas in the second period, the goals became diversified, less clear, and the U.S. became increasingly visible on the continent. So on the first period, as you may know, most African states achieved independence during the Cold War. Because Marxist themes resonated particularly well with African nationalists, that is, the leaders who had fought very hard for independence, many leaders in, of independent Africa at one point or another, in one form or another, adopted Marxist-Leninism to guide their domestic and foreign policies. The U.S., of course, was determined to prevent the spread of communism all over the world, and as the result of this containment policy, it entered the scene in Africa, notably in uh, Belgian Congo, Congo-Kinshasa, today Democratic Republic of Congo, where the first prime minister, Mr. Patrice Lumumba, showed signs of shall we say, communist um, leanings. So in this very strategic place, recall that the Congo has 11 neighbors and is extremely rich in minerals. In this strategic place, containing communism took the form of the U.S. supporting an ambitious rival of Lumumba's, namely Mobutu Sese Seko, and in doing so, the U.S. put one of Africa's worst rulers in power. Mobutu ruled Zaire from 1965 to 1997. The U.S. also became involved in liberation struggles during civil conflicts in Southern Africa by backing up particular groups such as Jonas Avimbi's UNITA, which fought against the Soviet-supported NPLA in the Angola Civil War that dragged for about three decades. Again here, the goal was containment and the result disastrous. In these two instances, Americans worked behind the scenes and made themselves virtually invisible while keeping focused on fighting communism. Moving on to the second period, things changed in the late 80s when it became clear that the liberal camp was winning the Cold War. At this point, the U.S. became interested in promoting free market capitalism and liberal democracy. To achieve this dual goal, it worked through the Bretton Woods sister institutions, namely the World Bank and the IMF, both of course controlled by the United States and its European allies. Using structural adjustment programs, which imposed liberal reform as a condition for receiving aid, the U.S. positioned itself to dictate the direction of both political and economic development in Sub-Saharan Africa. Overnight, literally, and in compliance with the neoliberal manifesto, quasi-democracies formed everywhere, and many of these malfunctioning democracies persist to this day. In the new millennium, a new set of players, including China and Brazil, entered the stage in Africa. 
This new development resulted in the U.S. once again redefining its role and adjusting its strategies accordingly. China has been portrayed as an insatiable resource hog and is perceived as a threat to American interests in Africa. It's a player seeking to replace the Washington consensus <coughs> or the Beijing consensus by offering African leaders an alternative to Western aid and the option to perpetuate authoritarian governments that torment African citizens, as is the case in Sudan. To counter the dragon's presence, America has come out of hiding, literally, making itself more visible than ever on the continent. Multiple state representatives, including Presidents George W. Bush and Barack Obama, have gone on state visits to the continent since 2000. In July 2009, in fact, while still pursuing good governance, Mr. Obama used the term partnership in a speech that he gave in Accra, Ghana. This marked a shift, at least in rhetoric, from an imperialistic attitude to one of perhaps respect for Africa. Africa, after all, is a fast-growing continent, and its urban population alone represents a huge growing market. We're talking about 400 million individuals. And of course, Africa's mineral riches are tremendous. Welcome as the shift was, shift in rhetoric at least. I think that the Obama administration has missed a unique opportunity to utilize Mr. Obama's political capital on the subcontinent. When he was elected, Africans felt that they had won the election and that a new day had come for both Americans and Africans. Because the son of the continent was now the leader of the world superpower, many Africans were hopeful, in fact some were convinced, and they were certain, that more exchange, meaningful exchange, and respectful exchange would happen between the USA and Sub-Saharan Africa, that Africa might even be given special attention. Strangely, this continent-wide enthusiasm was met with something resembling aloofness, as Africans were reminded politely that the President of the United States is in the business of promoting and defending American interests. So overall, my assessment is that the United States has struggled and continues to struggle to find its proper place in Sub-Saharan Africa. Thank you. Less than eight minutes. <laughs> the uh, second speaker is uh, just Professor Jessica Tietz, and also a political scientist who researches, whose focus research research focus is China. Please. Thank you. It's great to see such a large crowd today. Um, I wanted to start actually not with the historical relationship between the U.S. and China, but actually just a few nights ago. Um, did many of you watch the second presidential debate? A lot of you? Okay, great. Um, so you'll probably, for those of you who didn't see it, there was a short segment talking about who was going to be tougher on China, right, with each candidate trying to say how they would be tougher than the other one on China. And what's really interesting about this toughness on China, um, which is usually manifested in this idea of labeling China as a currency manipulator or trying to get them to stop unfair trade practices through their state-owned corporations. But what's really interesting about this rhetoric that we see in a U.S. presidential debate is that the root is really in fear. So the root of this is really this idea in political science that we call power transition theory. And this is the idea that as one country becomes stronger and another country becomes weaker, there's a point at which their relative capabilities get very close to one another. And that's when we might expect conflict between these two countries. Now, using political science theories, we would predict then that China, as it becomes stronger, will seek to challenge the United States in a military conflict. And if China is stronger than the United States, would win this military conflict and replace the United States as a world superpower. So if you are a U.S. policymaker, obviously seeing a strengthening China is something that you want to think about at least, if not avoiding, managing, right? So how do we manage the rise of China so that the United States doesn't get drawn into conflict? 
Um, and so when you hear people talking about being tough on China, that's really what they're trying to talk about, which is what is their policy for managing the rise of China so that it does not threaten the United States. Um, so what's really interesting, though, about this rhetoric is that we hear these differences, right, that Republicans would be tougher on China, that the Democrats would be tougher on China in maybe a different way, more to do with human rights versus trade practices. However, despite this rhetoric about who would be tougher on China, we see very little differences among administrations in U.S. policy toward China. So this rhetoric is just that. It's mostly rhetoric. Instead, what we see is that U.S. policy towards China has been remarkably constant since normalization of relations. Um, and this policy you could sort of describe as a mixture of economic engagement with military containment. And, and I'll talk about what that looks like. Um, recently, Secretary Clinton um, talked about a new U.S. strategy towards Asia, China in particular, called the pivot towards Asia. A lot of you probably heard about this on the news. And you're probably thinking that this is a new strategy, something new that the U.S. is going to do with uh, regards to China. But actually, all this pivot really is, is using the exact same strategies from before, but we're going to pay more attention to Asia. So we see differences in attention uh, toward Asia, especially China, but we really don't see much of a change. So despite all this rhetoric, we really see that despite whether it's a Republican or a Democratic administration, U.S. policy is this mixture of economic engagement with military containment. And what this really means is that we have this idea that if we engage China economically, we can show them the power of capitalism, right? And so we'll create an interdependent economic sphere, sort of the, the chimerica, I'm sure you've heard that word. Um, so the merging of the two economic realms of the United States and China. If you merge those two realms, you're unlikely to see conflict. So if your economy depends on another country, why would you ever attack that country? Right? So that's one way to manage the rise of China. Make sure that China's future success depends on the future success of the United States. Militarily, though, we have a different strategy, and that's a strategy of containment. And this is what Nadia talked about as well. So that strategy simply says, we need to make sure that China doesn't become stronger. So rather than trying to manage China's rise to make it interdependent with that of the United States, instead we'll try to make sure that China doesn't become stronger militarily. And the way that we've chosen to do that, especially as part of this pivot towards Asia, is to create alliances in the region that will hem China in and not allow China to become strong. And so we see a lot of this, as I'll talk about in a minute, in the East and South China Seas. So what I'd like to do now that I talked about what is the changing U.S. role and, and hopefully convinced you that there's very little change, right? There's a change in rhetoric, but as far as the policies towards China, they're remarkably stable. What I'd like to do now is talk a little bit about what does this pivot towards Asia mean, practically, and how is it perceived in China? Um, so the pivot then towards Asia, again, this, this mixture of economic engagement with military containment, what it means in China is very little. Again, this is a pretty constant policy that we've seen across administrations. So there isn't a lot of Chinese reaction to the rhetoric of this pivot towards Asia. We still see that China is pursuing an economic strategy of interdependence. They too want the Chimerica. They want this interdependence. Because again, if the economies are, are mutually joined, right, so that the success of one is the, is the success of the other, that also means that China will not attack the United States. So even if China becomes a much stronger country than the United States, it wouldn't attack the United States because its economy depends on the success of the United States. However, in military relations, we also see a more aggressive policy. So not looking for interdependence, not looking for military to military relations, but instead having a more competitive strategy. And in China, this strategy really focuses on the military. This is um, abbreviated the PLAN, if you are reading any articles about this, the PLA Navy. Um, and so, this really, the military strategy that um, China is using towards the United States is really a naval strategy. And this makes sense, right? If, China, if the United States is ever going to attack China, they're coming from the sea, right? So what this has meant in China is that traditionally China is a land-based power. All of the conflicts that China has fought have been with bordering countries. 
So for that, you need an army. You need land-based troops. So China has really had to reshape its military through a process of military modernization in order to have a stronger navy. And so for those of you who saw recently in the news that China just launched their first aircraft carrier that they themselves developed, this is part of the strategy that we're talking about. This is the military strategy then of China towards the United States, which is to defend the coastline from any U U.S. aggression. Um, so these strategies then that we see in China, um, especially in the East and South China Seas as China tries to defend and push out its territorial borders against the United States, are driven in China by two different views. So just like in the United States, we see in China that there are liberals and there are realists. The liberals are the ones who argue that we really need to use economic engagement and that's how China will become stronger, that's how China will become a superpower. Um, however, we see, especially in the military, a lot of uh, realist thinking. And what I mean by this, this is a political science term, simply means that there's competition for power. Um, this competition for power then is the idea that any relationship is zero sum, right? So there's going to be a power transition. And so if China doesn't come out on top, it's going to be the United States. It's a zero sum competition <coughs> and China needs to make sure that it comes out on top. So you see that these two groups both exist in China. So there's different public opinion in China, just like there's different public opinion in the United States. The way that this pivot towards Asia is playing out in China is very interesting after 2008. So after 2008, there's this renewal of confidence in China because China didn't have an economic crisis. So the US looks weaker, China looks stronger. And so the realists in China, or the people who argue that this is a zero-sum competition, they have become strengthened. And you see that they're pushing for more aggressive military strategies, like building the aircraft carrier. They're also pushing China to stand up to the United States in trade disputes and lots of other disputes. However, what we see again is that both China and the United States have had relatively constant policies of engagement and containment towards one another, and that despite these power shifts, so whether it's Republican or Democrat in the United States, realist or liberals in China, we see that the policy towards the other has remained fairly constant. And I argue that the reason for this is because this is the most sensible strategy. People haven't been able to come up with a better strategy. And that's because the future of these two countries are connected, right? They are linked together. We have a lot of mutual interests, and so, uh, you would expect that this strategy then of containment and engagement are going to continue. And the question that we have to face then for the future is how will power shifts in both countries alter that or will it? So if Mitt Romney wins versus Barack Obama in the United States or in China, the biggest power transition um, that we've seen in recent times is, is occurring now, with that power transition, will we see the same constant policies? Okay, I need to stop here, but hopefully we'll have more time to talk about this in Q&A. It's, it's a very large topic. Thank, Thank you. you. I hope that you are writing notes for yourself because we're going to have an, a lively discussion after that. The third uh, presenter is Professor Thierry Warren, who is our colleague in the economics department, uh, past chair of international studies program. Now it's International and Global Studies Program. Uh, and who is a professor of economics and finance at Ecole Polytechnique de Montréal. And he's also the vice president for strategy and international economics at a research center that houses more than 180 faculty researchers called Cyrano, also in Montréal. So please, let's uh, bring Chiang to the podium. Well, thank you so much for having me. It's good to be back home. <laughs> so, uh, I have to apologize. I am an economist. I will walk you through a couple of data and tables. I have 10 minutes, I know. So, the question was, how global is US power? A European perspective celebrating the uh, 10th anniversary of the RCFIA. 
Um, okay, yeah, it's not working this way. Okay, but first the RCFIA, uh, already 10 years, I mean, I cannot believe it, but when I look in the mirror, uh, I can see it with the 10 years. Um, so I want you to, to take maybe um, uh, 10 seconds to mention Felix Reitin and uh, President Ribovitz uh, did it, the international studies. Who changed it actually to international global studies? Uh, <laughs> okay, good move. Um, so the international studies and IPNE &E majors. Uh, 1,000, <laughs> nobody. <laughs> so 1,000 uh, lecturers came to um, the Reutin Center. Um, and I, I wanted just to highlight, actually, I could have picked up uh, many, 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 uh, just to highlight, actually, the, the, uh, the life, actually, of uh, Felix Reitin and, and also the life of Varian Fry. Um, uh, the widow of uh, Varian Fry came to uh, Middlebury College and received um, uh, and celebrated, actually, the memory of uh, Varian Fry. And, and just be curious and look at the biographies of these two people you'll see actually the, the spirit of the IPNE and, and IS uh, at Middlebury College. Um, so, uh, but now, so let's try to have an IPNE perspective. I mean, I am an economist, but maybe I can try to have an IPNE perspective. Um, well, Europe is a US creation. Shocking, no? Uh, why, Europe is a US creation. Um, so yes, the US is a big global power. Okay, but on ip &E perspective, if you are an ip &E student, uh, you should ask actually these questions. Okay, which definition of Europe? The European Union, the Schengen Europe, uh, free movement of people, the Economic and Monetary Union, uh, the European Free Trade Association. So if, um, if you are an ip &E student or an IS student with an economic focus, I mean, you should uh, wonder these questions. So, but now, let's remember the historical context. If you are a European, you can also say, well, yeah, but the US is a European creation. Um, but at the same time, uh, let's go back to early, I mean, the, the mid 20th century, so the World War II with the Marshall Plan, uh, the Communist <coughs> bloc, so that's, that's the historical context. Uh, the international organizations that we have nowadays, and Bretton Woods in particular, with a lot of economic consequences on Europe. So uh, the U.S. is definitely a global power and has uh, framed what Europe is nowadays. Uh, so this is uh, even in uh, the turmoil of the, of the public debt. Um, so to the core of the argument, so the U.S. is the U.S. still a global power from an EU perspective? I will walk you through the economic size. I mean, it goes faster to a micro perspective. I will talk about innovation, manufacturing, public debt, the new frontier as a segue uh, uh, with the previous uh, presentation, the EU with the US and not the EU uh, uh, versus the US. Um, so is the economic size, you see, this is from the CIA, it's not from Eurostat, it's not the European uh, uh, data, so this is from the CIA and the CIA actually puts the European Union first. The European, un the European Union is actually the first economic player in the world. This is not the US. So this is interesting because is the U.S. a global power? Well, actually, this is the European Union already. So keep that in mind. Oh, look, China, India. Okay, interesting. Uh, I will come back. So innovation, in terms of innovation, manufacturing, and growth, um, maybe you think actually that the U.S. is lagging behind and, and we need to protect actually the U.S. economy. Uh, from China and so on. I did a little study actually, so I looked at, uh, we have the chance of having a lot of data in economics and I looked at uh, a lot of industrial sectors, uh, manufacturing um, industries, and in fact, uh, the productivity in the US is still higher than it is in China and uh, India. So if you normalize actually uh, to one, so you see, I mean, the different sectors, uh, and look, so this is the US, but anyway, um, what you see is China is definitely on, the, on catching up with the US, so the US is still actually a global power, uh, and, and it's not against the EU, okay, so the frontier, uh, when we compare, is with the US, so the US is better than the EU in terms of uh, productivity in the manufacturing sector, um, and this is India. So. But now, um, is it <coughs> so if China and, and India is actually um, uh, catching up, is it an issue for uh, the US? When, when you look at China, 
Uh, why not you then can get rid of this allow? So this is Microsoft uh, talking to me. Uh, so when you look at um, the evolution of numbers uh, for major industries in China, it's still low tech, okay? 50% of the whole uh, manufacturing sector is still actually low tech and it is 65% uh, uh, in India. So it's still low tech. So in terms of innovation, the US is still uh, a global power and in front of the European Union. From a macro perspective, okay, you all know the story about Greece. Um, so if you look at the public debt, well, this is the United States. 104% um, is, in terms of GDP, is the public debt of the United States. This is big. And you, and you read about, uh, um, Europe actually being uh, um, attacked or under pressure because of the public debt and so on. Well, look, I don't want to use my laser because maybe actually would be uh, hit. But you see the European Union is here with 82%. Interesting, so the debt is actually more of an issue in the US or should be more of an issue in the US than it is in the European Union. Interesting, so let's look at Germany. So Germany is here, 82%. France, well, it's a socialist country. It must be 160%. Oh, no, 86%. So, um, so this is interesting. Um, so when you think about the macro perspective innovation, the U.S. wins. When you think about the macro perspective, the U.S. does not. So, hmm, okay. Let's move on to uh, uh, the current account balance. So the balance of trade. Of course, China, Germany, okay. Um, and then, I, this is also coming from the CIA, I mean, I'm trying to be very uh, neutral. So, and, and, then <laughs> and then you go down actually the ranking, and you look for the US, and you look also for the EU. Well, it's actually down, very down, 192 uh, is a ranking for the US in terms of balance of trade. France, Canada, um, it's UK, oh, the European Union. So not too good. I mean, really, the, the manufacturing is coming from uh, India, from China and India. So this is the new frontier. Those are actually the GDP growth rate per capita, uh, the GDP per capita growth rate. And what you see, so this is the US, this is India, this is China. So obviously, the growth is happening and the convergence is happening in these countries. So this is the new frontier. And, um, and what you see here is a poverty headcount ratio uh, in China and in India. So what it tells us is uh, when the poor actually are getting uh, better um, in, in China, and, and, and it's, which is better than in India already. Um, but what it's telling me also, um, and Jessica could actually uh, mention that better than I do, but you know what, in the Western world, uh, what we have well, if you start counting uh, the European Union, 500 million people, the US, 300 million people, uh, Australia, Canada, and so on, I mean, barely you get to 1 billion people. Already in China, only in China, you have 1.4 billion people. 700 million people live in cities in China, uh, which means two American dreams already, okay? But then when you go to China, you have also 700 million people living in the provinces, the rural provinces. So when you read numbers about China going down, I mean, maybe they won't develop as much and so on, well, they go through cycles like we do. I mean, this is the worst time ever since 1929. Um, but what's interesting is um, you still have two American dreams in China waiting, these 700 million people in, in the provinces. So um, maybe um, the future, I mean, is the U.S. Uh, still a global power? You see from an economic perspective, the U.S. is actually not the first global power. The first economic power is the EU. Uh, the first trading partner of China is not the U.S. The first trading partner of China is the European Union. Uh, so already, I mean, the U.S. is no longer a global power. Um, we, we think it is. Uh, and why do we think it is? We think it is because there is one president. There is no one president of the European Union. And this is an ip &E perspective. I mean, I started with the ip &E perspective. And this makes a lot of difference when you go to negotiations at the international level. But from a strict economic perspective, um, <coughs> maybe the future um, should be, since Europe is an American creation and since the US is a European creation, <laughs> maybe we should remember that in the Atlantic Transatlantic Alliance um, should um, sh should be solidified in light of the new frontiers. 
Presenter is Professor Mark Williams, also of our political science department, whose expertise is Latin American politics. Oh, this is yours. <laughs> Probably at the same time. <laughs> ah, thank you very much, uh, Timmy. Um, so I've got 10 minutes, right? Yes. Can I have some of her minutes? You know? <laughs> so the, the, the time is short, and the topic is how global is U.S. power? So if we think about this from a Latin American perspective, I can shrink the talk down substantially and free up some minutes to others. Um, if we think about it from the Latin American perspective, the argument would be that we had it, a lot of it. Uh, we don't anymore. Uh, there's some reasons why, and not everybody understands this. <laughs> the, that's the short version, and that's the truth. Uh, the three points that I would make is that obviously the United States has exercised enormous power uh, in Latin America, the hemisphere for decades. That's the first point. The second point is that today there is a paradox. The United States retains far more power um, than any other state in the region or any combination of states. Paradoxically, though, it has less regional influence now than any time in the last hundred years uh, in Latin America. The third point is that the reality of this new situation has not fully sunk in amongst all American political elites, and that can have some implications for how cordial U.S.-Latin American relations are uh, in the future, how much the two Americas can get done uh, working together down the line. So let me talk a little bit about the, the first point and the second point. I probably will not have time uh, to cover the third point, but maybe we can do that in Q&A. If you go back to the past, what do you see? You see that in the Western Hemisphere there was one constant that was important, and that was the overwhelming influence that the United States had in the region. It's power, and by power I mean the ability to realize preferred outcomes, the ability to alter the behavior of others. Um, to achieve your objectives. Under that definition, the United States didn't have a peer. Yeah, there were some regional challengers. There was Cuba, there was the Soviet Union, um, there was Chile, there was Nicaragua, uh, various kinds of regional challenges. But these challenges were all either beat back or they were contained. And none of these states ever came close to um, matching the United States in terms of its broad, sustained influence that it had in the region, and its ability to realize its preferences politically, economically, militarily, whatever. The source of this power, the source of this influence were the, the power resources that the U.S. had. Um, if you go back to 1900, even at that time, no state in the region came close to the Americas in terms of our capacity to project our military power. Uh, no state could match the United States' economic reach. None could match our uh, industrial might, our technological innovation. Uh, no states had the kind of soft power resources like influence in international institutions that the United States did. What does that mean for political scientists like me? If I think about it in terms of international systems, yeah, it tells me a couple of things. First, it says that throughout the 20th century, while the sort of global international system might have been sometimes multipolar or it might have been bipolar like during the Cold War. In the Western Hemisphere, the regional international system was always and decidedly unipolar. And in a unipolar system, the top dog, the hegemon, um, can devise rules to govern that system. And it could actually um, maybe impose the rules, but it could actually sort of milk the system uh, to its own benefit. And the United States did this. Some of the rules that the U.S did establish, one, that the United States would act as the gatekeeper between Latin America and external power, particularly the Europeans. It goes back to the Monroe Doctrine. Another rule that was devised was that the Latin governments had to defer to the United States on issues that were vitally, um, of vital strategic importance. And the third rule was that they would defer to the United States in terms of regional leadership. Please be clear about what I'm saying. I am not saying that the United States was ever uh, or always so strong that um, these states had no individual agency. 
They always had agency. But their ability to act was always circumscribed in terms of the rules that the United States had set down. Uh, one State Department official back in 1927 put it like this. Here's his quote, very famous quote. Uh, the views of our ministers in Central America have been accepted virtually as law in the capitals where they serve. We do control the destinies of Central America, and we do so for the simple reason that the national interest absolutely dictates it. Fast forward to 1961, John Kennedy's inaugural address where the president says, let all our neighbors know that we shall join with them to oppose aggression or subversion anywhere in the Americas, and let every other power know, he's talking to the Soviet Union, that this hemisphere intends to remain the master of its own house. Fast forward to 1994, and here is Bill Clinton convening a presidential summit in Miami, and all of the uh, state leaders, save for Cuba, come to Miami to hear President Clinton's vision and his agenda for the hemisphere. What was it? Strengthening democracy, expanding trade, and eventually integrating the hemisphere economically through the free trade agreement of the Americas. How am I doing on time? I'm fine? Okay. So, that's point number one. Overwhelming, sort of constant um, U.S. influence in the region that had no peer. My second point, the era of this kind of extraordinary influence is over. Uh, it's gone. Uh, we have less regional influence, and conversely, Latin American states have greater autonomy and independence uh, than they ever have. And I can give you a long list of examples, but if we just want to think about declining U.S. influence, the U.S.-backed FTAA gets torpedoed in 2005 by Argentina and Brazil and Uruguay and Venezuela. Uh, Bolivia. We don't think of it as being a strong state. It is a drug-producing state. It largely opts out of the U.S. war on drugs. Colombia, our closest strategic ally, actually refuses an extradition request that we make uh, against an alleged drug trafficker. And instead of sending him here, Colombia sends him to Venezuela, with whom we don't have very good relations uh, because of some crimes he might have committed there. Our share, the U.S. share, of exports to countries like Brazil and Chile and Peru had declined uh, noticeably while China's share of those same markets has grown. The United States finally has lost control basically of the Organization of American States as of 2005. So there's declining U.S. influence. There's rising U.S. Uh, rather Latin American independence. Since 2000, uh, the governments of Latin America have looked for political linkages and partnerships and economic opportunities in areas far beyond the U.S. orbit. And they found them. They forged stronger ties with China, with states in the South, with Europe. They formed new institutions that actually exclude the United States. And these institutions, like UNICER, the Union of South American States, allow them to pursue common objectives without having to listen to the preferences of the United States. Okay, thank you. There are many examples of um, expanded autonomy and independence in Latin America. The question is, what caused the big change? And there are three, uh, three factors, three causal factors. Democracy, one, the rise of China, two, and George W. Bush, <laughs> three. Democracy, first of all. Left of center leaders, uh, because of democracy, assume power in a lot of countries. They have to work from Argentina to Venezuela to Central America. These leaders want more independence uh, from the United States, and they're a lot less interested in neoliberal economic arrangements like the FTAA. Two, the rise of China. China has become a major economic player in the hemisphere. China dethroned Mexico as the second largest U.S. trading partner. Its um, uh, trade with the region has jumped its exports by uh, from $4 billion to $88 billion between 2000 and 2010. It's invested over $30 billion in a variety of joint ventures and infrastructure projects all over Latin America. China has a voracious appetite for the commodities that uh, the region exports. And what this has meant is that there's been a huge upsurge in foreign reserves and the economic foundations of um, Latin American states have improved. Mexico, since 2000, Mexico's foreign reserves doubled. Argentina, Venezuela's tripled. Brazil's grew five times. Bolivia's jumped by a factor of seven. All of this means is that China has indirectly provided 
uh, greater leverage to Latin American governments politically um, and economically. I'm still on here? No, you're 30 seconds. Okay. So, George W. Bush, he's the third factor. Um, his foreign policies and his person, I would say, uh, helped drive a wedge between the two Americas. He begins his presidency by talking with Mexico about immigration reform and maybe reforming NAFTA to facilitate uh, the free flow of labor and not just capital and services. 20 seconds. It's his foreign policies, the preemptive war against Iraq, it is the unilateralism, it is the, uh, the abuse of detainees and so forth that really uh, set Latin America askance towards the United States. And as a result of this, Latin America largely, in the, in the first decade of the 21st century, Latin America largely goes its own way on economics, on trade policy, on drug policy, on other things. Not everybody understands this in the United States. That's new, changed reality. And that has some implications for how the two Americas are going to interact down the line. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you. Um, our last speaker is Professor Matt Dickinson, the chair of the political science department, whose focus is on American <coughs> politics. Please. Thank you, Jimmy. Uh, I was very uh, interested to hear about all the programs that the Rowlton Center has sponsored, and I look around at this facility, I'm impressed with all these screens, because uh, we have none of this in American politics. American <laughs> politics is poor stepchild. I'm usually never invited here <laughs> to the Bob Jones University room. Uh, and what? Almost. Not Bob Jones? No. <laughs> Different Jones. Ah, okay. So is the new Crossroads Cafe not the Carl A. Rove Super PAC Crossroads Cafe? <laughs> Do I have that wrong? <laughs> Anyhow, I want to uh, uh, I want to ingratiate myself with our host by starting out the way I always start out my presidential election talks, which is there are four traditional subfields in the study of political science. Of the four, American politics is by far the most scientifically advanced. Um, and within American politics, the study of the presidency and presidential elections is the most scientifically advanced. It so happens we have an election coming up. We'll uh, you have plenty of opportunities to see that science in action next Monday. I'll be giving a, an election forecast talk. And of course, at the Carl Rove Crossroads Cafe, we'll have an election <laughs> at the grill night, and you'll be able to see whether our forecasts were accurate or not. Why do I bring that up here, besides patting myself on the back and asserting subfield superiority? I don't think I really need any other reason, but for the sake of harmony, I'll throw in the fact that foreign policy is going to be discussed in the third and final debate. And it raises the possibility that depending on the choice of the president, we may go in different foreign policy directions. In fact, both candidates on Monday are going to tell you that if you choose the other candidate, America is going to hell in a handbasket. The foreign policy will lead to the corrosion of American institutions and its supremacy in the world, and so therefore vote for me. I'm here to tell you that's wrong. It will make almost no difference in terms of our foreign policy who you elect. Uh, I'm not saying flip a coin on this. There may be other reasons why you prefer Mitt Romney over Barack Obama, but it's not likely to have a big impact on our foreign policy. Right? And I want to explain why um, very briefly today. First, it's not going to change our foreign policy objectives to any great degree. It's not going to change the constellation of issues that are facing us. It's not going to change the overriding factor that motivates the country in determining its foreign policy, which is maintaining self-interest, addressing self-interest. And most importantly, and the issue that I want to talk about here, it's not going to change the relatively weak authority the president has to conduct, implement, uh, and design foreign policy. The reality is, and I saw hints of this in uh, some of my colleagues' talks today, we vastly overstate the president's influence on foreign policy. Presidents of the United States have almost no influence in the making of foreign policy. Why? The founders designed the system that way. Occasionally there are exceptions, periods of peak crisis, when the system of shared powers falls to the wayside and presidents are expected to lead to conduct foreign policy almost unilaterally. Those instances are very short-lived, and almost immediately normal politics reasserts itself, and the normal constraints on the exercise of presidential power are implemented. Case in point, 50 years ago, what were we celebrating? Well, the end of the Cuban Missile Crisis, almost. 13 days, Khrushchev, Kennedy, head-to-head, -head. wasn't Kennedy by far one of the two most influential people in the world, wasn't this the epitome of presidential power? 
Yes, in the sense that those men in their negotiations determined to a large extent the fate of most of the world. Uh, it's the closest we've ever come to a nuclear exchange. But what we often don't remember in our um, recitation of the events is why we got into that situation in the first place. And the reason we got in is because John F. Kennedy felt compelled to respond to a decision by Khrushchev to put missiles on Cuba. Why did he feel compelled to respond? Did those missiles alter the strategic deterrence, the balance of power? They did not. Kennedy was told that, day one. He asked his military advisors, does it matter that there's a few additional missiles upside Cuba? Can take out Mickey Mouse. No, it does not upset the logic of deterrence. So why did he bring us to the brink of a nuclear exchange to force those missiles out? For the reason, domestic politics. As we now know, in the documents that have been released, the transcriptions of the conversations, Robert Kennedy told him you had to act. If you did not act, you would have been impeached. In the run-up to that Cuban Missile Crisis, a Republican senator in New York, Ken Keating, had been saying Kennedy was weak on communism and that he was allowing the Soviets to establish a beachhead in Cuba. If Kennedy did not act, there would have been consequences politically, domestically. Right? Those consequences are what is driving U.S. foreign policy today, not theories of uh, realism versus neoliberalism versus constructivism. It's domestic policies. It's Republicans versus Democrats. It's for fight of control of political institutions in the United States. That's what drives our foreign policy. That's what constrains the president. And those forces are going to be as strong under Mitt Romney as they are under Barack Obama. Not going to change dramatically. Right? Um, the reality is that in our system of foreign policy, barring these crises, presidents must negotiate. They must negotiate with their own military establishment. They're not often even alert, aware of what's happening on their watch. Take the Benghazi consulate. Right? One of the big debates is what did the president know and when did he know it? For 14 days, he sort of stuttered around trying to define whether this was a terrorist assignment or not. Why? He didn't know. And this is par for the course. Presidents are often the last to know. Think about why we got involved in a war in Iraq. Slam dunk, weapons of mass destruction. Bush wanted to believe that, but his best intelligence sources told him that there were no, I mean, there were weapons of mass destruction. Just as John F. Kennedy was assured by his best intelligence sources, the Soviets would never place missiles on Cuba, right? Presidents do not control the executive branch. They do not sit on the pinnacle issuing orders for the foreign policy establishment. They're at the mercy of experts who often have different interests in their own information. That's not going to change whether Mitt Romney or Barack Obama is, is uh, elected president. Right. Bottom line here, how much time do I have? Four minutes, three minutes and 25 So if I finish on foreign policy, can I go to the election forecast? Sure. Okay, great. Um, so if you don't believe my argument, let me bring forth the argument made by another political science professor, a brilliant man named Matt Dickinson. Four years ago, he gave a speech here. What did he say? He said, all the petals are coming down from heaven. The skies have opened. Finally, the light has come. We've elected Barack Obama president. He's going to change the direction of foreign policy. No more Guantanamo. No more military commissions. Right? We will get out of Afghanistan as soon as he's in office. Do you remember this stuff? Do you remember his campaign promises? Didn't happen. <clears throat> didn't happen. Right? Rhetoric may have changed. Substance of policy didn't change. We are... He escalated our presence in Afghanistan. He got us out of Iraq. Why? Because George Bush had negotiated the withdrawal treaty. He just had to implement it. Military commissions tried once to do a civil trial in New York. Didn't go anywhere. Still in place. Extraditing prisoners to third parties for interrogation. Still going on. Domestic surveillance. He's tightened it. Use of drones. Multiplied that. Violating national sovereignty to pursue American interests. He's done that more than Bush. Killed civilians in the interest. Even American civilians without subjecting them to arrest, trial, charge. He's done that. Why? Driven by the same political imperatives that drove his predecessor, right? The greatest fear of any American president and the greatest constraint on their action is no president can allow this country to be struck by a terrorist attack again. That's the overriding responsibility that dominates every decision they make in foreign policy. It will be the same for Mitt Romney as it was for Barack Obama, as it was for George W. Bush after 9-11. So now we have time for Q&A and we will 
do here what, uh, as we say in Hebrew, min haga makom, the custom of the place, and that is that we're going to have students ask questions first. So, uh, and you can address it to anybody on the panel, and if you don't remember the names, right there on the board. So, who wants to start? Please, stand up. That's a really good question. Um, it's, uh, presidents don't always honor their campaign promises, so um, <laughs> even, even if he makes that promise, it, it's not clear that he would actually have to do that. The reason that um, President Obama has, and I'm going to face this way because of the microphone, sorry. <laughs> um, the reason that President Obama has not uh, called China a currency manipulator is the same reason that's going to constrain Mitt Romney if he would take office, is that China is willing to talk about this behind closed doors, but as soon as they're labeled a currency manipulator, they're going to stop talking. And the truth of the currency is that they've allowed the currency to float and it's dramatically changed value. And they've made promises in private that they're going to continue to allow the currency to change slowly over time. But if you make it an issue where you're going to say the U.S. will force you to do this, domestically that won't fly in China just like that wouldn't fly in the United States if China said, United States citizens, we're going to set the value of your currency. Um, and so ch if there's a demand, China will likely stop letting the value of the currency change, where if this remains private, China will likely allow the currency levels to shift. And Mitt Romney knows this as well as President Obama does. Um, however, this is a, a good campaign issue. Thank you. I think that they were hoping for uh, more uh, recognition to be more visible in international politics and they were also certainly hoping for more trade between uh, the United States and China and in terms that were not as constraining as they had been before, in terms that maybe resembled more their trade with China. And so uh, I think that they were hoping for a lot of loosening up of the uh, sort of the, both the restrictions and the uh, prescriptions that were imposed on them over time, through the, especially through the uh, structural adjustment programs. Um, and I think those are the two, two ideas, really. Um, and they were very quickly disabused of the notion that uh, an African-American president, and literally African-American president, would, uh, um, would uh, favor um, Africa in its foreign policy. It hasn't happened at all, and so uh, they, we are disappointed. Any other questions from students? You can come back. Let's open it to uh, the rest of the guests. Go ahead, Mark. Uh, <coughs> I uh, attended the meeting on China and heard a wonderful presentation on why it was unlikely that China was going to overtake us. And uh, that speaker made the point that the U.S. is only happy when we're afraid of somebody. And he listed the Soviet Union, which of course is dissolved, Germany, which in the uh, reunification has been set back for decades, Japan and the stagnation. The EU, although Thierry tells us it's numero uno right now, uh, <laughs> last week or the week before, who knows what was happening with the Euro and the EU was going to fall apart, China. So my question is, is this panel somehow misnamed? Isn't the question that you're really talking about whether the US is the global power and not a global power? Clearly we are a global power on any of the, the standards of data that you guys have been talking about. 
But if we're just talking about the hegemony, you know, numero uno, can't we live with being a global power instead of the global power? Japan was eclipsed by China, and they could sleep. They slept that night after China became a larger economy than China, than the Japanese economy. Can't we exist uh, as a global power among other global powers? That's a really good question. Um, I, I guess the fear is, uh, in political science, we, we talk about countries being status quo powers versus revisionist powers. And the fear is, is that China is not a status quo power. So if China overtakes the United States, it has such different systems from the United States that it would fundamentally alter our international system. So the United States or Japan, the United States and Europe, you're talking about capitalist democracies. There might be some small differences, but your, your reality, you would wouldn't, you wouldn't have the UN disappearing, you wouldn't have the WTO disappearing. If China overtakes the United States and becomes a hegemonic power, what would the international system look like at that point? Would you still have a World Trade Organization? Would you still have a UN? China has stated that they don't really view these international institutions as having much value. So the question then would be, how would countries interact with each other? Would it become a more conflictual world stage? Does anybody else want to Okay, I'm going to try to be short, but I love the question actually because it's multiple questions in one. Um, well, so I am an economist, and uh, does it matter actually to me that one country is bigger, a superpower, and so on? I mean, it doesn't really matter actually. What, what we want is the wealth to be spread all over the place, and humanity is better, and everybody gets uh, what they want on, in their plate. Um, so, uh, yes, the U.S. was definitely, I mean, in the, in the 20th century, the uh, global power, I mean, with, with the Soviet Union, but then actually the U.S. became uh, the only one. And uh, from an economic perspective lately, actually, so the European Union, I mean, we, we can talk about the future of the European Union, but the, um, in the current status, the European Union is actually the first economic engine. It sounds weird when you read the newspapers, but this is true, actually, as uh, the European Union is the first economic engine of the world, with the second one very close, uh, the U.S. And um, so those are actually the economic powers, the consumers. Um, and then you have the manufacturing uh, part coming from uh, China and India. Um, what's interesting in your, in your uh, question is, uh, in particular, uh, is the fact that it's, uh, sometimes you read in the newspapers that the gravity is changing. So the U.S. is losing ground. We don't talk about the EU, I mean, because of Greece. So, so the U.S. Is, lo is losing some ground, and the gravity is moving to, uh, to China. But in fact, I mean, I would disagree with this uh, perspective. I mean, I, I would go uh, with your vision, which is we will have actually multiple uh, centers. Uh, we, we don't talk about internationalization anymore. We talk about regionalization in international economics. So it's about regions. The flag at the end of my presentation, it's one region. This is called the Western world. I mean, uh, it's one region. Um, and, um, and it's a reflection with uh, Felix Reutin uh, as well. Um, so I think, indeed, actually, the world will be more um, with more regions. But at the same time, I also I would disagree actually with the lecturer uh, you mentioned, because I think the paradigm has shifted. It's no longer the same paradigm. Before the colonial powers, really, uh, even when they made a mistake, a political mistake, uh, it didn't matter. Uh, the colonies would follow, and um, that's it. I mean, but now. It's a global, uh, even if a small firm is a global firm. Uh, you cannot, Apple gets a lot of stuff from s South Korea. So everything is interconnected, not everywhere. Africa is actually on the rise, but still far away. Um, so, but anyway, everything is interconnected. And um, so I, I don't think we can uh, think in terms and, and I don't think the paradigm should be in terms of countries anymore. The paradigm is, is more in terms of international firms uh, and, and cities, if you want, more than countries. A country, the political definition of a country uh, means something still nowadays. 
But from an economic perspective, I cannot say anymore, it's an American firm, it's a Canadian firm, it, and so on and so forth. I mean, no, it's actually a multinational. Uh, and, and a part of its production is coming from China, and innovation is coming from the US, and so on and so forth. So it's a paradigm uh, shift. Uh, and so I think we should use a new paradigm and look at the future of the world actually with the new paradigm. So long. The, the other thing that I would say, um, you, the, one of the questions that you asked was, can't, can't one live, the, the illusion that Japan and China, can't one live um, in a different reality uh, than you're accustomed to? I think that's a really good question, and, and I think that that is a question that has bearing in the Western Hemisphere. Um, the idea that the Western Hemisphere uh, is uh, America's backyard has a very long pedigree. And uh, as I was alluding to in the presentation, there are people who uh, understand the new situation. They may not like it a lot, but they understand it, and they, they um, are disposed to deal with this as a reality, and then there are others who don't understand it. And for those people, um, the idea of Latin American states demonstrating increasing independence from the United States on a whole range of issues is very unsettling. Yes, um, David Rosenberg, Global Affairs Institute. Uh, probably most of you folks here. Uh, basic question I have is what is the basis of power. Uh, the way you've been speaking, all of you, I've listened to your comments, and it seems like there's some financial economic dimensions of that power and some political, diplomatic, military dimensions of that power. And certainly from the East Asian point of view, the U.S. is declining in financial and economic terms. And I think China and Japan together finance about two-thirds of the foreign component of this debt that we hear about so much during this political campaign season. But uh, I don't see the clear linkage between that and military or diplomatic or political aspects of power. So there are, we divided this panel up geographically, but I think we all made reference to different aspects of power. So can any of you clarify or connect these at least two broad aspects of power, the financial, economic, and the political, diplomatic. How far can they get apart, or how can they get reintegrated again? Any thoughts about any of those questions? Mark, do you want to answer that? <laughs> there are obvious connections between the two. Um, economic, pro economic prowess fuels the capacity to industrialize and industrial might can be devoted towards military might. Technological innovation can be applied militarily. It also enhances uh, economic transactions. So th I, I think that there's a close interconnection there. I'm not really sure I understand the, the disarticulation that you were talking about because in my mind, as I, as I was saying in my presentation, the United States, if you were to look at the power resources that the United States could lay claim to, they spanned from economic to military to political through international institutions as well. So I, I'm not sure about the disarticulation that you're referring to. Well, a clear example of what was prompted by uh, Jessica's reference to the pivot. Mm -hmm. From an East Asian perspective, certainly in Taiwan and Japan in particular, it's not a pivot, mm -hmm. not really. And it, it overlooks the fact that uh, far more U.S. troops are being pulled out, and bases are being closed, and budgets are going down, and military aid and training and joint access are all declining in East Asia. So we can call it a pivot, and it may look like some kind of change is going on, but from their point of view, it's, it's not. Mm -hmm. Because they would say they can't, the U.S. no longer can afford it. They don't have the, the money to, to maintain these operations anymore. Mm -hmm. There are other things costing spending money, especially in the Middle East. Mm -hmm. I think in East Asia, the, the perspective is that 
not that the United States has actually lost economic power, because the United States still has a very, very strong economy. It has a, a really large customer base. So, you know, if you're if you're a country, you want to be active in the U.S. market. There's a lot of customers. The United States still gives a lot of money in foreign aid, um, even though there might be a relative deduction from some of these things. The U.S. is still very active in Asia, militarily, economically. I think what's changed is the perception of the U.S. as an untouchable hegemonic power, and that having the economic crisis in 2008-2009 created this idea that the United States was in decline. But in China, they're not thinking that this decline is now, in over two years or three years. They're thinking hundreds of years. They're thinking that, that you've started seeing the beginning of the breakdown of global capitalism as a system, but that this will take just as long to decline as it did to, to increase. And so in China, when they're talking about when China will overtake the United States, they're talking hundreds of years. There are a lot of problems in China. If you look at per capita incomes, they're nowhere near the United States. The United States is still very, very strong economically as well as militarily. But I think there's a change in perception. At the same time, um, at the same time this long view of uh, who is going to have power and how power is defined, I think, is going to have to change uh, very quickly because the way development has been carried out has depended so much on uh, the West's ability and China's ability to tap into natural resources to fuel their, you know, industries uh, and to feed into our consumers' habits. And I think that the long-term view might be. Uh, misguided um, it, to the extent that, you know, we are using finite resources and we're not sufficiently investing in alternative energies and so on and so forth. So uh, I'm not sure who's right, who has the right view here, but I really think that uh, the connection between economic power, uh, political power, and resource power is something that we need to uh, keep in mind. Um, but All right, let me try to take uh, a step. I think that uh, 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 Prof yeah. Professor Dickinson knows about American uh, foreign policy a lot better than I do. Um, the, you're not sure you said? Oh, okay. Um, <coughs> I think that uh, there is a common perception out there and of course being drummed up also by Israel about the close connection between Romney and, um, and Benjamin Netanyahu. Now Israel is about to have elections on the 22nd of January. Uh, it doesn't look that necessarily that Netanyahu is going to be the strongest party. As of today, it looks like there might be a centrist party that is going to be getting, if they get together, they'll get 25, 25 seats, which will probably be the biggest, the biggest party. So I think that, um, you know, uh, the U.S. went into this uh, presidential season with uh, uh, Netanyahu being very strong in Israel, and um, the, I think that the, um, at least the rhetoric about, um, that, that also came a lot in the Israeli press, was that uh, Romney is going to be a better friend to Israel, that uh, Net, um, Barack Obama will probably um, force Israel to have some kind of agreement with the Palestinians. We haven't seen any of this in the last four years, and I doubt that we will see it thereafter. Uh, what was your second question? Um, 
Right, it's very difficult and I don't think that we can put Syria and Libya in the same place. I think that uh, the situation in Syria is incredibly interesting. Uh, I don't know if you saw the statistics today. It's not just the 28,000 people who have disappeared, but, they, but the estimates are between 28,000 and 80,000 people who have disappeared. Um, uh, the, there has been no real interventions from the West and the United States. And there are several reasons for that. Some of it has to do with, uh, it's been very difficult because Russia and China have certain kind of interest in, in Syria and our um, uh, position in a particular way in the global institutions in the world that, that make it difficult for the United States to pass certain kind of um, mm, votes, resolutions. But I think that uh, there is another point that I think is really, we shouldn't forget. And it's not really clear who exactly the opposition forces in Syria are. And if they really are, as some of the reporters are saying, um, Hezbollah, um, some Al-Qaeda, um, then to arm them could be 